It may help lower stress, boost immunity and lung function, enhance memory, improve mental health, and help you cope with physical and emotional pain. What does singing do to your brain? By increasing blood flow through the body, singing also encourages the brain to release feel-good chemicals such as endorphins and increase neuroplasticity. So this is to encourage you to sing if you're not a big singer. So today we're coming together for worship. And when we worship, we declare the unique characteristics of God that apply to no one else. We praise God and celebrate him. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. Our God is holy, almighty, worthy to receive glory and honor and power, for he created all things, for he is great and does marvelous deeds. He says, do not worship other gods because it, because it is he who will deliver you from the hands of your enemies. Let's praise God together today.
continue this atmosphere of praise. Lord, a lot of times when we hear the word praise or worship, we think solely about singing. And I pray this morning that as we spend time in your word, that it would continue to be just an a, a, a opportunity to continue to praise and to worship you as we ask you, Lord, to do things in our life as you speak to us this morning. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would just continue to allow this atmosphere of praise to seep into our time of the word this morning. We pray so long in your precious name, Lord. Amen. 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 Hey, before you sit down and shake a few hands, greet one another. Kids, four and under, you can head downstairs for nursery. I agree. Good to see you. Yeah, bless you. Yeah, amen. Good morning, Lord bless you. Thank you. The bathroom? Yeah. Just go through there. On the right side. Good morning, everyone. If you want to grab your Bibles, we're going to jump into the Word together. Um, this year we've been talking about making sure that we have a mindset of the Lord. We don't have a mindset that is of our flesh or of this world. And a couple of different scriptures we've been looking at this year to help but remind us of that is 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. And that's what we've been praying for and seeking this year, that we would have um, a Christ-like mindset in the things we do. Romans 12, verse 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And again, that's what we're asking God to do this year, is to help us have more of a Christ-centered mindset rather than a mindset of the world or a mindset of our own. So this morning, we're going to talk about um, checking our motives to make sure that we're doing things that we should be doing the way that the Bible tells us that we should be doing it. And uh, we're going to spend some time in James chapter 2 this morning. We're going to look through verses 1 through 10, and we're going to be jumping back and forth a few different times because we want to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture this morning, so we'll be jumping back and forth. But I'd encourage you, once you get to James 2, put a bookmark there or your hand there because we will be jumping back continuously throughout this morning's message as we go through verses 1 through 10 together. Um, so a lot of times, and you've probably heard this before, but the, the Bible tells us about God's kingdom. And, and the kingdom of God, and seek ye first the kingdom of God, and, and God's kingdom, right? But a lot of times in our lives, we choose to promote our kingdom. We, we would say that I've got everything figured out in my little bubble, I've, I've found my comfort zone, I've been able to make life convenient and comfortable for me, and we've promoted our kingdom rather than God's kingdom. And we're going to look at that here this morning. James 2, if you want to turn with me to verse 1. James 2 verse 1 says this, My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, Here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, You stand here or sit on the floor by my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? So this all gets promoted through our flesh. She says, you've done this, you've judged and, and created this through your evil thoughts, which again, isn't the mind of the Lord, it's the mind of the flesh. This sounds a lot like uh, when David is getting anointed by Saul, right? First Samuel tells us, First Samuel 16, verse 6 through 7, uh, when they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab, which was David's older brother, and he thought, surely the Lord's anointed one stands before the Lord. He's looking at Eliab, he's like, this guy is going to be the next king. And this is what the Lord says after that in verse, uh, verses 6 and 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, <clears throat> for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things of, that man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at what? The heart. So Samuel's standing there and he's thinking, okay, it's going to be Eliab. But then he goes down to the rest of his verses and he says, okay, it's going to be this next one. It's going to be the next one. And then he finally gets to his spot and says, 
Okay, God's not anointing any of these ones. Who, do, you, do you have another kid around here somewhere that I don't know about? And he's like, yeah, David's out in the fields. And we all know that David's the one that ended up getting anointed, right? We look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the inward. And that's what we're trying to ask God to help us do. That we would allow God to show us how to look at people the way he looks at people. Like we've seen here in James 2, 1 through 4. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2 is another popular scripture. It tells us as well that we should be imitators of God, therefore as dearly loved children, and live a life of love, just as Christ has loved us and gave himself up for us, as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. So be imitators of who? Come on, church. Who should we be imitators of? God. Jesus, right? We need to be imitators of Christ. So if God's looking at the inward, he's looking at the heart rather than the outward, what should we be trying to do? What should we be trying to imitate? Looking at the inward, right? Looking at the heart rather than the outward appearance. <clears throat> and so this is what's happening at the time in the book of James. They're looking down on people due to their flesh. They're looking at people's appearance. They're looking at people's status. They're looking at what people are wearing, the clothes that they're wearing, to base their relationship off of other people. This sounds a lot like, too, you know, the Samaritans, okay? The Jewish people and the Samaritans were not getting along. They haven't been getting along for quite a while, quite a few years. And uh, Jesus now comes in on the scene, and he visits that well. We probably all know the story. He visits that well where the Samaritan woman is, 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 is there, and he asks the Samaritan woman to do what? To draw some water for him, right? Jesus is associating with someone he sh technically shouldn't be associating with because Jewish culture has said, wait, we're not going to associate ourselves with those people. Another Samaritan comes in on the story too, the parable of the, the good Samaritan, right? Yes. The guy is stand, laying there in the middle of the road because he got beat up. He's not doing well at all. And who comes by? The priest and the, the uh, Levite. And then another person comes by and no one comes to the aid of the Samaritan that's, or the, the, the gentleman that's there, you know, that just got beat up. And then who comes by? The good Samaritan, right? The Samaritan comes by. The Samaritan man comes by and helps this person the way that everyone else should have right before up until this point. Why? Because they were looking at the incident, that they were looking at the circumstance in a godly way rather than looking at the outward appearance. How many times do we do that, church? We might walk by someone or not associate ourselves with someone or, or push our, give, give, give some boundaries in our lives so that other people might not be able to approach us or hang out with us or talk to us because we're trying to push people off at a distance. So at the top of the slide, this is what I've labeled it. This is your kingdom based off of people. You've created yourself a kingdom based off of your likes, your dislikes, things that you approve, you disapprove. And you've pushed people off to a, bound, a, a certain boundary in your life because you want to keep your distance from these people. And you've created your kingdom rather than advancing God's kingdom. The next kingdom we're going to look at, continuing on with your kingdom, we're going to also look at our treasures. How oftentimes we can allow our treasures or earthly gain to promote your kingdom rather than God's kingdom. So James 2, we're jumping back to James 2 together, starting in verse 5. He says, listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom that he's promised those who love him? But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting him? And are not they the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? So again, there at the beginning of verse 5, he says, Listen, my dear brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom that he's promised to those he loves, to inherit the kingdom of God? There's a couple different um, churches in the book of Revelation that hits this as well. If you want to turn with me to the book of Revelation. Revelation 2, starting in verse 8, we're going to look at the church of Smyrna. And this is what it says to the church of Smyrna in chapter 2 of Revelation, starting in verse 8. It says to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write this. These are the words of him who is the first and the last, who died and came to life again. He says, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you are rich. I know the slander of those who say they, were, they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil who put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. 
Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. And then he says this at the end, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes will not be hurt at all by the second death. So as we read this, this letter to Smyrna, we have that, that recollection at, in verse 11 that we who have an ear need to hear what the Spirit is saying to this church. And he says, even though you're poor, you're in poverty, you, uh, verse, <clears throat> verse uh, 9 again, I know your afflictions and your poverty, yet you're rich. Why are you rich? Because you've got Jesus. And you're walking in his kingdom and, and walking in his life rather than, you know, woe is me. Look at my afflictions. Look at my poverty. Look at this. No, I'm choosing to not advance my kingdom, but I'm choosing to advance the kingdom of God. And he says that there's a richness that comes with this. We see a flip side of this in chapter 3. <clears throat> the church of Laodicea does the complete opposite of what the church of Smyrna does. And we see this in chapter 3, verse 14. To the angel of the, the church in Laodicea, write this. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold, and I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'll spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, and I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy, buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and, and, and salve to put your eyes Put on your eyes so that you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Just as I overcame and sat down with my father on his. And then again he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. <coughs> So Laodicea has got the opposite side of this. They're looking for wealth. They're looking for promotion. They're looking at self-centeredness. They're looking at selfishness and pride. They're trying to boost up the riches of this world rather than, again, sharing in the suffering of our Lord and, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Jesus. And he goes on. He says, these are the things you're going to have in your life because of this. It says this in verse 17. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold or fine and fire so that you may become rich and that the, and you might wear the white clothes so you can cover your shameful nakedness and a salve to put on your eyes so that you can see. God tells us, and he's telling the church of Laodicea, he's saying, you don't have to keep running after the things of this world. I'm going to give you the things you need that are going to be eternal things. Those white robes are, are eternal robes and it's going to talk about, you know, if you continue to read the Revelation, he continues to talk more and more about those who are dressed in white. But he looks not only at what we're experiencing now with the kingdom of God, but he also looks at what our eternal value is as well. It's not just my promotion of treasures here on earth, but it's what God is going to allow us to have as treasures forever in eternity. I've shared this joke before, and I wanted to share it again this morning. Somebody had mentioned this, you know, maybe 10 or 15 years ago, about a couple guys that were going into heaven. And, and they see St. Peter there as they're walking into heaven. And, and they say, hey, uh, we've got all this stuff. Where do we need to check in all this stuff as we're coming into heaven? And he's like, what, what do you got? What, why, why do you have all these bags full of something? It looks heavy. And, and these two guys open up their bags. And it's just bars and bars and bars of gold that they've been collecting. Gold that they've been collecting their whole time here on earth. And, and Peter, St. Peter turns to the other angel and says, man, why are they bringing pavement into heaven? You know, these things, these things that we collect as treasures here on earth, you know, can, can, are meaningless in the light of God's glory, in the light of eternity, in the light of the things that God finds value. We might find value in a different way, but we need to have a mindset of God. Amen. We need to have a mindset of God rather than having that mind of the world. So we see a couple of churches here, like I said, Revelation one. Smyrna, which was poor, but God commended them for being rich. And later, the Sia, who outwardly looked rich, but inwardly they were poor, pitiful, and wretched. 1 Corinthians 1, 27-29, tell us also, But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and He chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. 
He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, and the things that are not, to nullify the things that are, so that no one may boast before him. Jesus, we all know this, we studied this a few a few months ago, Christmas time. He came in a lowly manger as, as a baby, to be born of a, of, a, of a human, of a woman. Chosen the lowly things, rather than coming in, you know, at 33 years old, on this donkey, right away, coming in as, as a king of kings, on, on an earthly standpoint. He came in to this world in a lowly manger. And God continues to remind us, and Paul points out here, he continues to remind us in many different points of scripture, that he cho- chooses the lowly things. He chooses us. He chooses us because we are just w- living a life for God rather than <clears throat> look at all the stuff I've got. When he chose those 12 disciples, they weren't kings, were they? Were they? They weren't these amazing people that everyone's like, man, I can't wait to get around Peter. I can't wait to get around <clears throat> uh, Luke. I can't wait to get around these other people. Like John, Simon. They were fishermen, they were tax collectors, they were people that no one wanted to be around, but God chose them to continue to advance his kingdom after he was going to leave. And we have to take a step back to it to remind ourselves that God can use even the lowly things in our lives to promote and advance his kingdom if we choose to let go of ours and choose to let go of our treasures. Let's all turn to Matthew. Matthew 6, Jesus talks about a, a well-known scripture we probably have heard a time or two. Matthew 6 Starting in verse 19 together. Matthew 6, 19. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, and if your eye is good, the whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are bad, the whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. He says you cannot serve both God and money. We can't be sitting on our throne, and I wanted to grab a lazy boy this week and just kind of set it up in front of the church this morning and just keep, you know, sitting back on what we would say is my kingdom, my kingdom, my kingdom. God says you can't can't walk out with his kingdom and serve your kingdom at the same time. There's going to be a moment where you're going to start despising one or the other because with our kingdom, our, our treasures, our earthly gain, We're going to start wanting to gravitate towards those things when God says, hey, let them go. We can't do both things. You can't hold on to both things is what he points out to him. And he says again in verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What did we say at the beginning of this message? God looks at the heart, right? Hey, Eliab is not the one. The next brother is not the one. The next brother is not the one. I'm not looking at appearance. I am looking at the heart. So where is your heart, church? Are you storing up things on earth? Are you sitting on your lazy boy of your kingdom, allowing all this stuff to be promoted in your life? Or is it God and his kingdom that you're promoting? Luke 12, 13 through 21 gives a very similar description of this. Luke chapter 12, verse 13. It says, and this is the parable of the rich fool. It says, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. And Jesus replied, man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable, the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what should I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And there I'll store all my grain and all my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. 
So I'm going to ask you another question if you're taking notes this morning, church. Are you rich towards God? Are you storing up things on earth? Are you trying to allow your kingdom to get bigger and bigger so you can... He says, he says I've, I've been able to do all this. He says in verse 19, I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. So take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. I sit right back down to my lazy boy here this morning and say, man, look at the things that I've done. All the things that I've accomplished. All the things that I've done to make my life easier. And Jesus says, you're a fool. You've made your life easier on earth, but guess what? What if your life was taken the next morning and you're just sitting there with all of this stuff that's not going to be taken with you into heaven? Again, the top of the slide, your kingdom and your treasures. There's a couple other times in the, in the Bible that talk about, you know, the rich, the rich young man who came to Jesus and said, hey, I want to follow you. And what did Jesus tell that guy? Give away everything. Sell everything and come follow me. And he was struggling between, man, I don't want to give up everything. I've, I've worked so hard for all this stuff. Can I, can, I give up, can I give up a little bit of it? And then Jesus says it's going to be easier for, <clears throat> he, he talks about how it's going to be easier for a, a camel to, or for, yeah, for the, eye. <laughs> the camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. If you don't know what that means, back in the day, back in, in this time setting, there were walls around each of the different cities. And in order to get through the wall of the city, there was a gate. And sometimes that gate would have another little gate to be able to allow people to come through in a slow manner. And that was called the eye of the needle. To be able to go through that small little section to be able to come into the city. And obviously for a camel to come into the city, he would have to get down on his knees and try to crawl through these, these small doors and able to get into the city rather than having those big doors open so that the caravans of camels can come through. Hmm. How many times have you guys seen a camel get down on his knees and try to crawl through something? It'd be hard. Now if I were to ask you tomorrow, hey, I've got some camels, let's try to get this, let's try to put this into practice. I'd be like, yeah, I'll, I'll sign up to try to do that. It'd be hard. <clears throat> And he says, it's easier for a camel to try to get through that than for the rich man to get into heaven. Why? Because I have established my kingdom with my treasures. I'm going to take life easy rather than following God and his kingdom. James chapter 2, if you want to jump back to me, verse 7, we hit that as well. But I want to highlight one last thing here before we move on. James 2, verse 7, he says this. Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of whom, of him to whom you belong? These rich people are the ones who are saying, man, I, I, Jesus, I don't want to hear about Jesus. I, God, we're taking you to court right now. I, I want what you've got. And they're slandering the name of Christ. I'm going to ask you if you're taking notes this morning. Write this down. It says this again. Are they not the ones slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? Who do you belong to, church? Who do you belong to? Who is the noble name you belong to? Is it you sitting in your lazy boy of life? Everything's great and I'm, I'm the king of my kingdom. Or are you really belonging to the king of kings? <clears throat> Jesus. Whose kingdom are you promoting? The last thing we see here in verses 8 through 10, we start to see one more kingdom that we can fleshly establish and that is through our emotions. James chapter 2 verse 8 says this, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. Leviticus 19.18, a lot of times, if you want to turn there, Leviticus 19.18, a lot of times we think, love your neighbor as yourself, love, love your enemies, love... Uh, this this command of love those around you, love your neighbor as yourself. We always think of Jesus being the one that says this, and he does say this. But this comes a few thousand years earlier in Leviticus 19, where when they're bringing forth the Levitical law, it says, Do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So this isn't something new that Jesus walked in on in, in, in the book of Matthew and, and, and Mark where he says, you know, love your neighbors as yourself. This has been around since the Levitical law got, got put together. To love your neighbors as yourself. 
So we have to check our emotions as well. Am I loving the people around me? Or am I again sitting in my lazy boy and just loving the things that, that people might be able to help me establish a better kingdom in my life? Like I said, Jesus says this as well in Matthew 22. Love your neighbor as yourself. And all the law of the prophets hangs on these two commandments. Love your neighbor as yourself. Who else does the Bible tell us to love? He says love your neighbor. It tells about how we need to love strangers. Love our enemies. Love the orphan and the widow. Love our leaders. And continuing on and on and on, he tells us to continue to love people. Now, if I'm sitting just in my relaxed state of, I've been able to make everything perfect and easy and simple for me, I'm not going to need anybody else in my life if I've been able to create this perfect setting of my kingdom. We've got to strip that away so we can love those who might seem less desirable in our lives. Those people we've pushed away from our kingdom, we want to allow God's love to establish a relationship with others rather than just the people that we think might be able to help us build up a better kingdom. Last week I told you this, God tells us to love as I have loved you. He doesn't just say, Jesus doesn't just say, hey, love your neighbors, love the person sitting next to you at church this morning, love, love, love <clears throat> those people that are in your life. He says, love as I have loved you. We've got this calling to again check our motives and ask, am I doing, am I doing that in my own life? James chapter 2, verse 10, we're going to read that one more time. It says, For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. We start to see the fulfillment of God's will and his character is the expression of the law. God's will, his character, his desire for us to be walking in this loving manner, this loving life, this life that is full of love, it is just an expression of the law which we jump back to Matthew 22 one more time with. Teacher, in Matthew 22, verse 36, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. We see that there's a fulfillment of this in verse 10. Where he says, but whoever keeps the whole law, yet stumbles at just one point, is guilty of breaking all of it. What do we need to do, church? Let's be vocal for a second. What are we called to do? We're called to love. Jesus says, they'll know you as my disciples because of your... Wait a second. You'll know, they'll know that you are my disciples because of your... Come on, church. Where are you at? They'll know, they'll know you're my disciples because of your... Check your emotions. If I'm walking into work tomorrow morning bitter and upset and angry because this happened, that happened, that happened, and I don't want to be around these people today, am I going to be promoting Jesus or am I going to be promoting my kingdom? When I go home later that day, <clears throat> let's say Monday evening rolls around, I've had a terrible day at work and I walk into my house and, and I want to be able to share God's love with my family, with my spouse, with my children. And I walk in all angry and bitter and upset because of what happened at work today. And I allow that tone to, to resonate the rest of the evening. Am I promoting love? No. We've got to check our emotions, church. Sure, it's easy for us to stay in bitterness. It's easy for us to stay angry at someone. It's easy for us to stay upset with the circumstances of life. But Revelation 2 because of your afflictions and your poverty, it's not just your poverty, but because of your affliction and your continuous desire to follow my will rather than the will of yourself, you are actually rich rather than poor. So church, I'm going to ask you this question. I want you to be thinking about it all week long. Do my emotions promote me or do they promote God? Do my treasures promote me or do they promote God? The way that I react around and treat other people, does it promote me and my agenda, or does it promote God and his kingdom? Our relationship with people, our treasures, and our emotions, again, they should all point back to the kingdom of God. He says a couple last things as we come to a close. Matthew 6, 
<clears throat> We're going to jump back to Matthew 6 together. Starting in verse 25. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or what you will drink, or about your body, and what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or stow away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? And why do you worry about clothes? See the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. The worldly mindset is to run after all of these things that we would proclaim we need. He says this again in verse 31. Don't even the pagans run after all these things. But he gets into verse 33 and he says, but this is God's mindset when it comes to all this. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So what are we supposed to seek, church? God's kingdom. There's the answer I'll ask again. What are we supposed to seek? God's kingdom. His righteousness. His kingdom. Stop worrying about the things on earth. Stop worrying about your relationship with other people being, being a standoffish relationship. Stop worrying about... <clears throat> All these treasures that you're trying to promote and build up for yourself a bigger, better barn. Stop worrying about how <clears throat> that person makes you feel and start worrying about, I would rather seek God's kingdom and try to promote a godly relationship with these people rather than worry about, well, they might step on my toes, they might hurt my feelings, they might do something, but I'm going to love as Christ has loved me. Acts 2, 42-47. I want to, us to hone in for a moment as we come to a close worship team. You can come on up. Acts 2, 42. We're going to look at what this looks like within a church. This whole message we've been talking about us as individuals. How we need to seek God's kingdom rather than our own. But as we do this as a church, we see something really beautiful come forth. In Acts 2, we're starting together in verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. In verse 45, they were selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone who had a need. And every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily, those who have been saved. Sandwiched between all of this is verse 25. I don't know how many times you've looked at this with a Christ-centered mindset, or if you've just kind of glossed over it as a list of things that the church was doing. They were devoting themselves to the teaching and the fellowship, breaking of bread, prayer. Many signs and wonders were happening. Oh, verse 45, they were selling their possessions of goods. I want you to think about this one more time. I'm going to read through it. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Church, I want you to look at me for a moment. When was the last time you sold something for someone else that was in need? When was the last time you gave up something because you know that someone around you was in need? That's what the church was doing. Yeah, they were fellowshipping, and they were listening to the preacher teach, the, the apostle teach, and they were breaking bread and fellowshipping with one another. But, but that, was, that was building them together as a church. And they take a step back and, and ask, your kingdom, what are you willing to give up in your kingdom for the advancing of God's, and, and God's kingdom? And, and this is what they were doing. They were literally selling their possessions because they saw the people in the community had need. And what happened after that? 
God started adding people to their numbers daily, not, not to promote a bigger, better church, but they were being saved is what it says there at the end of verse 47. Salvation was finding the people in their community because the church wasn't holding on to the treasures of their kingdom. Instead, what they were doing was getting rid of their kingdom to seek God's instead. So if you're taking church, if you're taking notes this morning, church, I'm going to ask you, when was the last time you gave something up to help someone else in need? Or are we in such a time where it's just easy to give a few bucks to someone rather than really meeting a need right where they're at? We live in America, church. It's easy for us to build up, build up, build up and store for ourselves the pleasures of our lives. But when was the last time we gave up something to help someone else? And as we evaluate and self-examinate, we ask the question, is it because I'm promoting myself and my lifestyle, an easy, comfortable life, rather than promoting Jesus and His kingdom? It might not just be selling possessions, church. It might be giving your time. It's another American thing we like to hold on to, right? My time, my time, my time. This is me time. When was the last time you gave up time for someone else that was in need? Church, if we want to be able to share the love of Jesus with other people so that they may find a Savior like we found a Savior through Jesus, we need to learn to start letting go of these things that we've accumulated in our kingdoms and instead seek His kingdom first and His righteousness. And he says, when we do that, all these things will be added unto you. If you want to stand with me as we come to a close with a song. <laughs>